Yeah, just on the cloud. It's recording. Thanks. Okay. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Ahu Gumra Domandi Parry uh, with us to speak to us uh, about did uh, sorry to, to speak to us as part of the EPSRC Network Plus in digitalized surface manufacturing. And the title is, of the talk is Bio-inspired hierarchical materials and composites. Just a few words about Ahu. Um, Ahu is a materials chemist, and she was the first recipient of the BPI CAM Kathleen Lonsdale Research Fellowship in 2019 for her work on bio-inspired advanced materials. She graduated with a PhD in material science and engineering from Sabanki University, Istanbul, Turkey, in which she explored the rational design of metal catalysts for the synthesis of carbon nanotubes. She has worked at the University of Cambridge, uh, at the Adolfi Merkel Institute in Switzerland, uh, as a postdoctoral research fellow working on the development of high performance fibers and biomimetic photonic films. And before her Kathleen Lonsdale fellowship, she worked at uh, Imperial College uh, London as a teaching fellow in advanced materials characterization for three years. Her current research focuses on the understanding of the self assembly process in relation to the intrinsic properties of the colloidal building blocks for developing complex and adaptive materials for sensing technologies, for self-cleaning surfaces, for life, light harvesting systems, and for tissue scaff scaffolds. Thus, most of the research activities in her group uh, go into tailoring shape, size, and surface chemistry of colloidal nanoparticles to produce structurally ordered materials by the self-assembly process. And her group goes by the acronym BIOFUM. Uh, so I'm going to uh, pass over to, to Ahu now. And if I've got anything wrong there, Ahu, please, please correct. And um, over to you. Thank you so much, Alan, uh, for the invitation and for the introduction. Um, for, and today I'm very pleased to share the work uh, that we do all of in my group, uh, Biofarm, and I will give a little bit of summary before uh, coming to Manchester, what I was doing at, uh, as a postdoctoral researcher and the new initiatives we take on since I moved to Manchester as well. So today I will start by the, introducing the biomimicry wheel uh, to you. Uh, so the spiral of this design uh, starts with defining an engineering problem, finding a biological analog in the nature and discovering the properties. Uh, and it will go on. But in most of the research groups, in, uh, including mine, what we are doing is we are finding a biological species that is very interesting and trying to understand how it works and trying to mimic later on. So there is a little bit discrepancy with how the uh, Biomimicry Institute uh, advises us to develop this um, science and how we are doing it. But the key point is biological matter evolved in the through billions of years of evolution. So all the matter we see around us is highly optimized and adaptive and we can take so much inspiration from it. So when we see a, a structure that is um, optimized, what we are trying to do is discover properties through using the uh, imaging techniques as well as different characterization methods. And we are bringing down to its basics, making abstract what will work and, um, as a similar uh, material analog. And we are trying to emulate that basic structure and see if that um, if the characters are fitting to the what biologically or nat naturally produced and the spiral goes on. And nature works with a very specific type of building blocks. So we have proteins, 
polysaccharides and mineral matter. And they like to organize themselves in a certain way. Uh, so from the protein groups, we have collagen, silk, and keratin. From the sugar polysaccharides group, we have chitin and cellulose. Uh, and we have calcium carbonate for making mineral matter, silica, and calcium phosphate. So the abundant materials are always there. The life is based on carbon and mineral matter to support this system is based on either silicon or calcium, which are most abundant uh, materials on earth crust. Nature favors similar patterns, and we see this uh, repeating over and over again. And I will give you some examples throughout my talk about this as well. So one particular thing happens for both proteins and uh, uh, polysaccharides is that we have a polymer chain, but that those polymer chains like to agglomerate in a certain way. And these are strong polymer chains, so they like to make fibers. So it, the composites fiber technology already starts from there as an idea, because the polymer ch chains come together to make nanofibrillate structures, or, and those nanofibrillated structures come together to make more um, major fiber structures. And these from polymer to the, the higher degree of uh, organization and another degree of organization gives us the hierarchical perspective of how nature builds up uh, structures layer by layer almost. And we have the final stage of uh, final morphology given, uh, and that produces a function, which I will repeat a few times, but uh, you will see the key point, me repeating that. So when we are looking at these biomaterials, they are smart materials. So they know how to clean, uh, heal themselves. They know how to clean themselves. Uh, they respond to dynamical changes around them. So they can adapt and respond. Uh, and they can take either chemical or physical triggers. And they also have memory. So these are very, uh, and they don't need to have intelligence to be smart. It is just the materials, uh, the, this hierarchical structure actually allows all these interactions to take place. And if there is room, enough room in the material between crystalline and amorphous domains to really um, adapt itself to a new conformation, new orientation, and new organization. One thing about the biological matter, though, they are um, made of mostly soft matter, and they are working conditions are not maybe not most suitable for the engineering applications we are requiring to do, because they need to operate between uh, room temperatures, maybe sometimes uh, lower temperatures, and they need to go only up to 70 uh, degrees, for example. So for many engineering applications, we need to adapt some of these materials um, uh, behavior and elevate it by supporting with different types of materials. So what we are trying to understand here is, although the biological matter has beautiful multifunctionality and surface interactions, how we can translate what we learn from nature into a specific engineering application. So in the classical engineering, what we would like to do is we melt metals or polymers and we put them into a shape because we know that that shape is going to give uh, give us a functionality right so um we know that if i if we can mold a silicon uh into this foam uh, cover it will act as a uh, foam uh, 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 foam coverage, right? Uh, or if you make a metal and if you give the screw shape, it will act as a screw. So it will have that functionality. This works beautifully. And we discovered working and shaping materials, molding into them from the very early ages of the civilization, right? But what we are stuck with is we cannot expand on these technologies because this is what we call top-down approaches. With the top-down approaches, you cannot go further than submicron, uh, submicron lengths, and we cannot direct material further in that zone. So what we would like to do is 
taking inspiration from nature at this stage, how nature produces a material. The building blocks we talked about is self-assembled. All that fiber structures or other kind of mineral matter organizations happens through self-assembly. So the supramolecular organization really directs and you can start from simple building blocks like Legos and make it into complex shapes like DNA. So reoccurring themes are, we have bottom-up energy saving approaches, multifunctionality comes uh, from responsiveness, resilience, adaptiveness, and we have a very beautiful non-toxic uh, uh, material scheme. And shapes and patterns are the most important. And that's why my group is always trying to really look into what the shape is gonna do, what this shape is gonna adapt into. So one of the applications that really inspired me early on was the, we live in a beautiful, colorful world and nature really learned to build up colors. And this wasn't always the case because early stages of evolution, there was no coloration, but as the vision kicked in into evolution and the, the uh, the world or the biological, the diversity took another turn in the world. And nature built up very beautiful pigmentation, which is used a lot of times, but also nature uses a certain particular way of organ organizing matter in, a, uh, in an array, in, an or, uh, in a very, very ordered state to interact with light. Uh, and that's what we call structural coloration. So in all these uh, examples, the um, main component, and this is like the most outer layer of the species, few microns think, thick, but still a very striking color appearance. Um, here we have cellulose, chitin, uh, keratin, melanin, and guanin, very high refractive index um, polymers organized in a certain way to give us a structural coloration. So how does it work? Normally these polymers are transparent, but if you put them in an organ organization of multi-layers that are gonna interact with the wavelengths of the light, we will have a structural color response, like soap bubble, for example. We have a thin layer and the light bounces off and traps inside and the refractive index of the uh, surfactant in this case and the thickness of the film is gonna give us a color response. Nature takes one step further, then makes multi-layered surfaces and these multi-layered surfaces, we have an average refractive index and thicknesses of individual surfaces or averages uh, is gonna again, give us a color response. And as I said, this is only a few micron thickness. So it shows that you can be very efficient with using so little of a material, but getting a very enhanced color uh, reaction from a matter. Like nature, we are also very color driven, like all the other bi biological species. Nature uses for signaling, nature uses for um, camouflage, nature uses for mating. We also use it, it is playing for our emotions, but also we can do so much with the color of a material. It can be a sensing mechanism, it can be a, um, it can give us warning signs or it can be used for detection. So while uh, color is good for playing with our emotions and the industry is heavily using it, but also we can make so much more with the color. So the interest turned into finding a specific concept. And the concept I was very interested in was these bulligant, what we call structures. Bulligan structure means that the fibers are not aligned parallel, but they twist on top of each other. And with the twisting, we have a complete of turning and making a helicoidal structure. So that's what we call bulligan. And when, when you look at nature, you see that um, the fish uses collagen, the mantis shrimp uses chitin, 
and uh, um, the algae uses cellulose to make these uh, bulligan layers over and over again. So nature likes to repeat some patterns. And in these cases, it is the mechanical properties that driven uh, the structural organization, because when you are building composites, and if the composite has every direction is addressed, so you have reinforcing units from every single angle, right? So you made a strong material. But also, this kind of helicoidal organization seems to play optically as well. So we are not very sure in evolutionary scale which came first, the mechanical reinforcement, most likely, or optical. The optical properties is interesting because it gives the beetles or the berries, now you see me, now you don't see me kind of effect. We don't know if there are the organisms that, can, that has this, this kind of polarized view because these are circular polarization. Normal sunlight is not circularly polarized, but there might be some species that has circular vision and these might be able to uh, differentiate in under those circumstances. So this is food for thought. But also the more exciting part is, can we repeat this effect by using synthetic materials? But better than that, can we repeat this effect by using the same building block, but working it out differently? So what we did was take, we took the cotton balls and then we just, um, uh, differentiate the crystalline parts because cellulose is made of crystalline and amorphous parts. So we isolated the crystalline parts through uh, uh, acid digestion and made these rod-like nanoparticles uh, with surface charges around them. And if you let these um, uh, rods, cellulose nanocrystals, what we call them, uh, in a petri dish, and if you evaporate it from water evaporation in the system, you end up with this organization. So these rods go through this self-organization all through at room temperature all by themselves. And the stages for this um, organization are, we have isotropic nanoparticles, cellulose nanocrystals, and as you evaporate water, they are attracted to each other and they are forming these subunits. It's like the crystallization theory. They have this initiation state of the crystals that we call tactoids. And these tactoids are, have the helicoidal order that we observed before in the berry structure. And at the second stage of the um, self-assembly, what, what happens is two tactoids merge together to make um, larger tactoids. And at a certain stage, when tactoids merge together, they cannot move anymore. So they are arrested in that state and they cannot uh, evolve in the self assembly scale further. So if there are some uh, defects in them, they will track the defects in them. So that's what we call kinetic arrest. So from that stage onwards, what uh, the one helicoidal uh, turn we call pitch, that pitch is going to be just squeezing down as the water releases itself from the, these layers, and we have a dry film with color response. And uh, we are observing how this self-assembly takes place under a microscope, and we can see the stages of how we are uh, evolving in the self-assembly scale of matter. So what we can do in Manchester, we also built this uh, system. Uh, you can come to us with any kind of uh, colloidal matter and we will figure out how this system self-assembles, how it is gonna give a response and how it is gonna really organize itself on any surface. So which, which, is, which gives us really good opportunities to discover materials interaction with different surfaces and with themselves as well. So this was one of the achievements we uh, were able to demonstrate one-to-one -one replication of the berry structure. Uh, and we also shown many applications coming from this system, strain sensors, uh, edible colorimetric sensors, which I started a um, 
collaboration with one of the companies through the Sustainable Material Innovation Hub here in Manchester and Shape Memory Photonic Films. So since I moved here, Manchester, I'm still working with these cellulose, uh, cellulosic films. Uh, one properties we discovered was we can make anti-counterfeiting features on banknotes. If we ever use banknotes uh, again in our lives, that, uh, that might be something we will look into. Because we know that the confinement effect that we have in the films is making certain certain um, surface uh, lines and patterns and shapes and that can be used that polarization effect can be used to identify a security feature and we also started 3d printing cellulosic faces and through 3d printing we are regulating the matter in a way that morpho butterfly regulates itself um, if you came across with the morpho butterfly, you would uh, you would realize that it is very shiny. It is highly iridescent, but the iridescence or the blue coloration doesn't change. The reason that color doesn't change is that they have this wide triangular shapes of pillars. While the diffraction grating is here, the diffraction grating is also spread out through triangulars that gives or that eliminates the angular dependence. Similarly, we eliminated the angular dependence by introducing these regular wrinkling effects that was never shown before. So we are very pleased about that. We are also uh, uh, electro spinning the uh, liquid crystal and phases of the um, matter as well and getting uh, circularly polarized nanofibrils themselves. And another student of mine uh, is working on making the silicon dioxide particles and through the vertical deposition we are making synthetic opals for sensing applications for um, detection of uh, diseases, which is very, very relevant these days. Okay, so there are so many different um, transitions uh, and functionalities in the nature we see. And I've shown you so, so many examples of structural coloration. This was very big drive in my group, but what, we started looking at surface interactions, weighting and microfluidics, mechanical actuation and photosynthetic properties since I moved to Manchester as well. And we are very amazed by the effects we can get with this and how we can eliminate so many um, high energy demanding processes from, uh, from an engineering application basically. So why we are dr driven by the biological surfaces, um, the, the patterns on the surfaces causes a lot of effects, but the, the reoccurring uh, theme is we need patterns on surfaces to get certain effects. And shark skin, uh, the lotus plants, gecko feet, moth eye, morpho butterfly, uh, I shown an example, all have this patterning effects. So what those do, patterns do, they bring in wear resistance, they bring in mechanical sensing, they bring in water repellents, uh, as well as color because anti-reflective surfaces are just surfaces. Uh, and there is an optimized performance between all these effects as well. So these surfaces have all this effect we call superhydrophobicity. So when you put a drop on any surface, what happens is that the liquid molecules on the surface are feeling a little bit disturbed because they don't have as many um, similar species as, uh, as the bulk right here, somewhere inside the droplet. So this, um, this is energetically unfavored. So it generates this drop to confine in a spherical um, uh, shape to minimize its surface area. Because as, as soon as the surface is small, they are in a better, um, better place. And what we call contact angle 
is the balance between these surface tensions or the interactions between different layers, uh, liquid vapor, solid liquid, or solid vapor interfaces. So the balance between them is the contact angle, and this is the Young's um, model for sur surface expressing surface tension. And this is Wenzel model because the Young's model is idealized. There is no roughness is considered, but most surfaces have some roughness. So the Wenzel model is considering these surfaces. And the Cassie Baxter model is actually bringing in the, how those roughnesses, the material character of those roughnesses plays a role. How the, the, when the various materials and textures really interact. And most of the cases are not isolated actually. Most of the cases you see transition between benzyl state into Cassie Baxter and vice versa. So there are different mo modes of that. But most importantly, for getting a contact angle and getting the liquid behavior with the solid surface, you shouldn't be looking at the standing particle. You should be looking at a particle on the move because the resistance to move is the most important. Um, resistance to move is the most important uh, factor in understanding if a uh, surface is wetting or if the sur if the uh, super hydrophobicity is actually um, uh, taking place. So there are so many super hydrophobic surfaces in nature. Morpho butterfly is one of those. And some beetles, for example, most beetles are using um, wax layer on their shells to be hy uh, hydrophobic actually, but some beetles like this longhorn beetle, uh, there are some hydro super hydrophobic parts and there is very hydrophilic parts. So it makes it like almost like a water management system all embedded on, on the shelf. So there's so much we can get inspiration from. And there are so many studies. This is a top-down approach um, using micro machinery. So through interference lithography and etching these layers and removing the masks and going through thermal oxidation and removal of the oxidation states, um, many types of pa patterns and pillars can be introduced uh, to a surface. Or you can select a self-assembly approach or the bottom-up approach, just coat so, um, a layer on the surface and through uh, cross-linking, UV radiation uh, or some um, yeah, oxidation, we can also introduce some uh, patterns on the surface as well. Another one is the the slippery surfaces is pitcher plant. Um, this is known to, um, so this part, the neck part of the plant is to, to really use the, on a wet day, what will happen is the insect legs would really slide through and will be go, gone to the almost like the digesting part of the plant. And the effect comes from whenever the, this part, the surface gets wet, it be, becomes highly lubricative and it, nothing can attach on the surface. So it becomes irresistible. So inspired by that, um, a group in Harvard uh, by Eisenberg um, de developed this porous, uh, uh, porous uh, structure and through lubrication, like just like the water lubricates the surface here in the pitcher plant, uh, they were able to make um, very slippery surfaces that can uh, self heal and it, it has highly defrosting properties as well. So it's, it was a very good um, milestone in this area. You can also introduce very interesting wrinkles through cross-linking um, through uh, uh, oxidation of the surface as well. So um, overcoming uh, this dynamic uh, of 
liquid slipping on the surface uh, is a big challenge and we need to really understand the interfacial properties of this liquid um, the liquid solid interfaces porous interfaces um, and how we can control this is a big good challenge for us and we are very interested in that area something we are not working on right now but i wanted to mention here is the sticky surfaces inspired by the gecko feet Again, we have uh, gecko feet shows lots of fibrillar uh, structures, pillars, uh, and these can these are very extra soft matter. They can conform into any shape, so they have very good mechanical sturdiness as well as uh, adaptability to really go into the shape of the surface, so they can stick. Uh, so tiltability, that mechanical integrity, is very very important. And one last thing that I want to also mention is the shark skin, um, especially the, the, the differences between, so this is from the head of the shark and this is from the tail of this uh, species of shark and uh, changes. Um, the, the texture of the shark skin also um, aligned with the direction of the moon gives a very lowering of the drag force in the, for this animal, so it can move very, very fast. And when we design things um, that also lift the, hopefully get, can get lift the drag ratios, um, it will give us a very big savings in terms of energy consumption. So we, that's very relevant for airplanes, wind turbines, um, ships or uh, submarines, drones and helicopters. So marine application areas, as I pointed, is again optical materials, sensors, detection systems, but changing surface topography will give us anti-fouling, antibacterial, antiviral services, sur uh, surfaces. And through uh, changing the chemistry, we have an uh, opportunity to do self-cleaning, self-healing, anti-corrosion. And um, we can also develop some membranes, uh, separation systems, delivery de devices as well. So inspired by that, we also developed a project called ICAM 70. Um, uh, we secured seed funding from uh, BP ICAM to really address the fouling problem in seen in the metal surfaces. So um, most of the uh, anti-fouling coatings applied on the me metal surfaces are toxic materials. And what we are trying to achieve is by mimicking the lotus effect and the shark skin effect, can we get there? So our methodology is again, uh, bottom up. Uh, so what we are building is core shell nanoparticles with cross-linked polymers based on cellulose, one of our favorite materials. And what we are doing is using spin coating and 3D printing devices. And then uh, these polymer network as well as the core shell particles are dispersed, but can we put them in a shape? Can we give them this hierarchical surface so that they can act similar to morpho or um, shark skin uh, or any wrinkled skin, slippery surfaces we've seen in nature? So Emre, uh, one of my uh, students that is also in this meeting is working on that. He is just at the beginning of his journey there. But as I said, there's so much more inspiration from nature to come. And we are also looking into photosynthesis and mechanical properties and actuation right now. So yeah, um, I'm very uh, pleased to uh, build a group that uh, are brilliant scientists. So I'd like to thank my team first, Luz, Tadeusz, Shashin Emre, Matt, Yuchan, and few people already came and gone, the master's students. And, uh, and we were very fortunate to acquire um, support by, through studentships and through funding as well from all these resources. So thank you so much for your attention. And this is, I will leave it here. This is my group's website and my email address if you would like to con uh, contact me. And I'm ready for your questions. Thank you.
Uh, that, that was uh, brilliant, Ahu. Really, really interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, it was worth the wait for the delay that we had to, had to go through. So if anybody's got any, any questions, uh, the best way is to post them in the chat, I think. I think there are some um, questions on the chat. The only thing I can see are Pamela's questions about the affiliations. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Nicholas. Oh, there's one from Nicholas, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. In the biomimicry spiral, which steps would you say takes the most time and effort, which take most uh, creativity? Uh, that's a really good question um, because it makes me think. Um, I think characterization is the most straightforward parts because but we need to understand and i think understanding the biological mechanism how it works is is a challenge because it's very complex usually so you cannot isolate one effect from the other very quickly so um that part is challenging but also fun because it is like putting uh, pieces of a puzzle together right um, I think the most creative part is you need to consider a colloidal system and it will replicate what nature does from our perspective, because we don't do top down. If I were doing top down, I would just put everything under a lithography, emboss the uh, texture and get that. But for us, we would like a manufacturing method and a colloidal system to work with that uh, manufacturing methods. So in that sense, I think the creativity comes uh, in that space. It worked for us thus far, but I'm also always looking into um, collaborating with different people to show me different uh, particle systems and colloidal systems to work on it. I hope this answers your question. Very good. Uh, well, Nicholas can can uh, can speak with you separately if needed. So yeah. we have another one here from Stefan uh, Dimov. What about combining top-down and bottom-up approaches? Is the advantages going for such combined approach and looking for synergies? Yeah, I think that's a really good point as well. Um, we are uh, we are already started to bring the, these two concepts together. We are using 3D printing as well as inkjet printing. And we are, tr we are relying on the 3D printing to make, give us the major line pattern or the shape, but we also put colloidal particles in there. So we want both the colloidal interactions, but as well as the uh, secondary components so we can make hierarchical uh, shapes and structures. Yeah, I think that you can make use of colloidal matter is the key point though. You need to have the right building block to be able to facilitate those interactions inside the machinery, basically. Yeah. So Stefan also says, have you considered the durability of such hierarchical surface to topographies? Yeah. Um, as I said, we are not trying to use pure polymeric surfaces. Uh, we are looking into durable, uh, stable surface, making a surface that is stable. For In terms of the coloration, they are durable. We know that. And they are more durable than pigmentation because as long as the structure is there, we have the color. Pigmentation degrades in time. Mm. But structure can as well. You know, if, if you have a textured surface, it can lose its texture with time. Yes. Yes, but self-cleaning properties also kick in. So it has its own um, advantages comes in with it. Uh, but obviously, uh, I think making the best of both worlds, some coating material that uh, can give good properties, can we make them into colloidals? So can they be textured uh, as well? So I would think of from both angles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing that struck me as you were speaking, and this, this is a slightly curved ball, as they say, um, 
you, you're right in that most uh, we think nature operates in the minus 20 to 70 range and you know 99 percent of applications on earth are, are natural uh, phenomena are that kind of uh, temperature range i just wonder if we, there's anything where it's outside that range where nature has a, adopted or, or adapted to temperatures that are outside that range? Um, well, it is a curveball answer. Maybe this is, uh, uh, there are, there is bacteria that lives in highly acidic conditions and at very high temperatures. So we know that uh, life finds a way to yeah. adapt. Uh, so yes, uh, the, the, my, my always the concern is that we know that these structures are working perfectly and they've been very comfortable working in these ranges. So would we push this forward or would we try to use their structure as a starting point and adapt it to silicon, for example, because silicon is more uh, temperature resistant material than carbon. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, and there are so many analogies between silicon and carbon as well. So I think uh, this gives us the creativity nature didn't need probably. Uh, because it was a, it always goes to low energy and uh, low effort uh, processes. So, but we have um, the thought process that can also go into it. Yeah, I think we can assume from what we know is that nature, wherever it is in the universe, where the temperatures are different, will have adapted. To, yeah. You know, the, you know, we're talking about Mars and subsurface and what goes on, and you know, some of these environments are very extreme. Yeah. extreme temperature extreme acidity whatever and um it's encouraging i guess that nature will have adopted what i was thinking is in earth beneath the surface of course it can be very very hot yeah. and i just wonder you know what nature has done beneath the surface in terms of adapting to that different temperature I th uh, materials maybe have, have, have been developed, um, you know, under yeah. conditions of pressure or temperature or yeah. whatever. Yeah, um, I think around the hydrothermal sources, we see the crystallizations are different, material organization, all that. Uh, yeah, mineral matter formations are different, but yeah. also there is um, there are species working in that. Mushrooms are working in that conditions. Yeah, bacteria is working. So and and they are the most adaptive forms of matter because they have different uh, cycles of lifetime. Yeah. 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 It's just a thought, you know, because we, we have a group in the Royce, which is in investigating materials for demanding environments. Yeah. And, uh, you know, of course, we know the body is a demanding environment. But when you start to think about extremes of pressure and temperature, maybe there are instances we've not thought about where we can learn from nature. Also. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. OK, any uh, any more questions? I don't see any more. Okay, in the chat. so I think we can probably bring it to a conclusion. This will be available on um, on the network's YouTube page. And all I can do is thank you once again, Ahu, and apologize for the glitch we had at the beginning. Uh, it will be investigated by Pamela <laughs> to, to stop it happening again. And we just thank you very, very sincerely for what, what you've said. And really, really excellent. Thank you thank very you much. So much. Thank you so much. It Thank was you. my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.